Straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. R. Kelly's former runner says he drove young girls on the singer's behalf. The allegations of keeping teenagers confined to rooms on R. Kelly's property. The girls being forced to ask for permission to eat. But fans of the courthouse standing behind him. He didn't do this. He needs to be set free. Request denied. The major league pitcher accused of beating and bruising a woman. Her order of protection now dissolved against Trevor Bauer. The allegation is they consented to this rough sex. So what do you do? Is Robert Durst regretting sitting down for the HBO series The Jinx? How the real estate heir's interview is now impacting his murder trial. I lied to Andrew repeatedly. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Day three of testimony in the R. Kelly trial, the singer's former runner is now telling a federal jury girls who looked really young were driven around and kept locked up on R. Kelly's request. Anthony Navarro says that they worked for that he worked for Taylor Swift, Jay Z, and Kanye, but working for R. Kelly was quote weird a weird time for him. Said things you had to do was a bit uncomfortable, and that the music part was good, but. Once he walked past the gates, it was the twilight zone, a different world. He spoke about transporting girls who looked really young to and from the home and picking out Valtrex at the pharmacy, a medication for herpes. On cross, he spoke about not seeing physical abuse, but saw verbal abuse, that R. Kelly worked long hours and explained how doors did not have locks and some rooms had bathrooms, and that he heard females call R. Kelly daddy. Terry, the prosecution also brought in R. Kelly's former doctor, Chris McGrath. They spent a great deal on the t of time questioning him about R. Kelly's herpes infections. Do you think they were able to establish that R. Kelly knowingly transmitted the disease to, to his sexual partners? You know, it's going to be a question of timing here. McGrath treated Kelly since 1984, and he suspected as early as 2000 that Kelly might just have herpes. And he told Kelly at that time to inform his partners. The public health law requires disclosure of that information, so that's why that's important. But documentation for these prescriptions really didn't start until March 2007, and the documentation of his history of having herpes didn't start until 2011. So there's going to be some question as far as the prosecution is concerned as to whether or not they can show, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Kelly knew he had herpes and that he was knowingly infecting his partners. That's the question. Yeah, it's going to come down, I think, at least in most part, to the credibility of those witnesses testifying, because the question is, did he inform them of that, or did he do it uh, without telling them? And so that's going to be something for the jury to decide, absolutely. Now, R. Kelly's fans are known for standing by him, and one woman is leading a group of supporters in front of the courthouse throughout the trial. I've been a fan of R. Kelly since 1996. I was listening to his music, and from I was living overseas, and I came here. I've been living here for 22 years, and I've been a supporter of R. Kelly for all these years, and I know that R. Kelly is an innocent man, and all these ladies that make false allegations against him, um, they, are, they are lying. They're fake, and all of them saying the same story because I get to understand that all of them is communicating together, and they fix the stories together. Let's bring in our guest, Judge Susan Chris. Your Honor, listening to the defense, they weren't really denying uh, there was sex or the age of the girls, because there were some Freudian slips there at times, uh, just that they lied about their age and embellished about certain rules. Does that sound like jury nullification to you? And do you think it will work? It does sound like jury nullification, and, and I don't think it will work. Ignorance of the law is not an excuse. In some cases where maybe there was a small age difference and the girl really, really was older and sophisticated, in some fact situations, even though it's not an excuse, a jury might feel sorry for the guy and, and go along with it, but not in this situation where there's such a disparity, not only in age, but in power and control and the number of girls. This is not, not a good defense. Yeah, I think that point that you made is very important, power and control. It's one thing to say, hey, I went to a bar and they're supposed to ID someone and I went home with that person, but it's very different to have 
girls, as they were, were transported back and forth. Terry, outside of the court, uh, there were many R. Kelly supporters often dancing to his music. Uh, inside the court, do you think jurors will struggle to separate the man from the musician? It could very well be a struggle, but the evidence against Kelly is overwhelming. There are multiple victims, and these victims have encounters that took place over a number of years, very similar accusations. But I do think his fans, and that could include some of the jury, will think about the fact that this is a legend. He won three Grammy Awards just for the song, I Believe I Can Fly. He certainly was Billboard's most successful artist for multiple years, for almost a decade. And it is a fact that, you know, he is going to be hard to separate him as a person and him as a legend. So I think hopefully the jury is going to be able to fairly consider the evidence and make sure they apply the law like the judge is telling them to do. That's the important part. Yeah, and let's talk about the law a little, because the defense, Terry, uh, did talk about this not being an enterprise, not being an organization. Uh, speaking more about the RICO charges uh, against R. Kelly, that his employees are not feeding him women. What do you think about that distinction the defense is trying to make in this case? You know, I think that the defense is going to lose on that. It is a creative claim. The RICO claim is something that we haven't seen in this type of case. We've seen it with mafia cases. But I think they have all of the elements. The enterprise is, of course, Kelly and his organization. The runners are the different people in that enterprise. So I think it could succeed. Yeah, it's interesting. They're starting to bring up those witnesses to connect those dots in this enterprise. Of course, we'll keep looking at that to help you connect the dots in this, the U.S. v. R. Kelly trial. Turning now to more top legal news, Britney Spears has found herself under investigation. The pop star is accused of striking one of her employees. According to the Ventura County Sheriff's Office, one of Britney Spears' employees says she was hit during a dispute. Someone who works for the pop star called authorities on Monday evening. TMZ is reporting Spears allegedly slapped a housekeeper's phone out of her hands. The Sheriff's Office says no one was injured. Britney Spears' attorney is responding to the allegation, calling an overblown sensational tabloid fodder. The investigation into the incident is expected to be completed shortly. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, shocking new allegations against the accused Kenosha shooter, Kyle Rittenhouse. But first, the MLB pitcher scoring a legal win. Why a judge rejected a permanent restraining order request from a woman who says Trevor Bauer beat her. Our legal analysis, next. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back. A judge in California denies a woman's request for a permanent restraining order after her, she claimed a Dodgers pitcher left her seriously injured after sex. Law and Crimes' Anjanette Levy is here with what the judge said about the allegations against Trevor Bauer. Brian, the accuser, who we are not identifying, claimed that Trevor Bauer left her with black eyes, injuries to her head, and to her genital area. But from the very beginning, Trevor Bauer said all of this was consensual. He's on administrative leave, but L.A. Dodgers pitcher Trevor Bauer gets a win off the mound as a Los Angeles County judge denied a woman's request for a permanent restraining order against him. The woman's injuries were caused during so-called rough sex between Bauer and her on two occasions last spring. Judge Diana Gold Saltman called photos of the woman's injuries terrible, but in denying the request for a restraining order said, if she set limits and he exceeded them, this case would have been clear, but she set limits without considering all the consequences and respondent did not exceed limits that the petitioner set. Law and crime legal analyst, Gene Rossi. There was not enough evidence presented to this judge that in the future, especially five years down the road, Mr. Bauer would pose such a grave threat that they need a protective order to protect the victim's um, welfare and her life. 
The 27-year-old accuser testified against Bauer over three days, admitting she had battled alcoholism. But Bauer's team produced text messages in which the woman had asked Bauer to choke her out and, quote, give me all the pain. Bauer pleaded the fifth, refusing to answer questions. The accuser included Instagram messages between her and Bauer in her request for a restraining order, in which he wrote, I feel so bad that this happened. Wish I could be there with you through it. To which she responded, just grateful that you are showing you care. Bauer then sent a Yoda gif captioned, me trying to use the force to heal you. After hearing three days of testimony, the judge also dissolved a temporary restraining order against Bauer, and Pasadena police are investigating whether criminal charges should be filed. If they can't even get a protective order, I think we have serious litigation risks if we try to go criminal where the burden of proof is much higher. I contacted p police in Pasadena, California, and they told me that they have no new information to share about the investigation. Meanwhile, Trevor Bauer's lawyers said that they expected this request for the permanent restraining order to be denied, and they were pleased with the judge's decision. Bauer remains on administrative leave by Major League Baseball as an investigation by that organization continues. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. Let's bring back Judge Chris and Terry Austin. Terry, do you think there was a victim-blaming situation here, or was it necessary to consider the victim's intent in this case? Brian, I think this is a very unusual case. It's the first time I've seen something quite like this. In most sexual assault cases, consent is really not an issue. The victim is claiming that there was no consent at all whatsoever. But here with these two sexual encounters, there was some degree of consent by the victim. And the judge did conclude, as Anjanette said, that the woman set the limits and that the respondent did not exceed those limits. So for that reason, there was no further restraining order imposed. But, you know, I think so there had to be a discussion about this. And I think that the fact that she, quote unquote, asked for it had to be discussed. It sounds harsh. It sounds terrible. But it's part of the case here. And, you know, the whole point is that you understand the need to have that discussion when consent is given, at least for most of what occurred here. Absolutely. And to Gene Rossi's point, the level for which you can get a restraining order is so low, it kind of makes you think they might not be criminal charges here. But, Your Honor, you heard the words of the judge in her ruling about the limits and exceeding them and, and that they weren't exceeded. What did you think about how the judge responded to this uh, restraining order? Well, there's a much different burden than a temporary injunction. So that's, uh, but as Judge as the other commentator said, there's a much higher one for a criminal case. I think this is this is this is unusual. And yet, if you think about Fifty Shades of Grey, this is what Fifty Shades of Grey is about. It seems so weird that you would have a contract, so to speak, that allowed pain, that you're consenting to pain. But some people do, and some people do like that. And I think the judge is kind of struggling with how do you fashion a remedy to protect someone from themselves and their own efforts to get this done to them. This is, I don't think it's victim shaming here. And I, and I think the judge is just kind of struggling with that and maybe second guessing herself a little bit, which may not be a bad, it's not always a bad thing for judges to second guess themselves. Agreed. And Jeanette, did another woman make similar claims against Trevor Bauer? Yeah, actually the Washington Post had a story recently that reported that a woman in Ohio had filed for a temporary restraining order against Trevor Bauer last year for an incident that happened a few years ago, or a couple of incidents, but then that the woman dismissed that restraining order on her own several weeks later after Bauer threatened legal action with his lawyers. So um, that protection order was never really in effect for very long, and Bauer had also considered that relationship or called that relationship consensual. He had written about it on Twitter. And apparently that woman is now cooperating, according to the Washington Post, with the Major League Baseball investigation, which is ongoing. I did reach out to that woman's lawyer, and he did not return my request for comment. All right. We've got two investigations going on. We'll make sure to give you those updates as they come in. Thank you all. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, the investigative journalist speaking out about Jeffrey Epstein and the upcoming trial for his former ma madam. 
Plus, the shocking new video investigators say they have of Kyle Rittenhouse. What the accused Kenosha shooter allegedly said just says well, he's accused of killing two people after the break. Welcome back. We return with updates from the accused Kenosha shooter and new evidence the prosecution wants to present. Cal Rittenhouse is accused of shooting and killing two unarmed men and injuring a third during a Black Lives Matter protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Prosecutors now say Rittenhouse is seen on video from last summer wishing he had his AR-15 as he watches a black man jogging out of a pharmacy. In the video that was taken about two weeks before the shooting, Rittenhouse allegedly says, I'd start shooting rounds at them. Prosecutors say the 17-year-old's desire to shoot people is doubly relevant in the upcoming trial where the defense will try to claim self-defense. Rittenhouse's trial is set to start November 1st. Prosecutors for Jeffrey Epstein's Madam Ghislaine Maxwell are asking a judge to withhold the names of her uncharged co-conspirators. Maxwell is expected to stand trial in November, and federal prosecutors are now indicating they won't be shining a spotlight on other people accused of aiding and abetting Epstein. In court documents, prosecutors say they only plan to introduce statements by Epstein himself and an employee that scheduled his massage appointments. Law and Crimes Managing Editor Adam Klasfeld spoke with Julie K. Brown, a journalist for the Miami Herald and author of Perversion of Justice, on the latest episode of his podcast, Objections. What Epstein and his uh, co-conspirators did was it was not a transactional sexual uh, arrangement. It wasn't like I'm going to pay you $200 for sex. He used fraud and coercion to get these girls to do this. He did not tell them what was really going to happen. He, he used other girls to lure them in. And he basically, they, they used the the spiel that he was going to get, they were only being hired to give him a massage. So to characterize this, even back then when it was legal for a minor to have sex, you know, for money, to characterize this as prostitution was totally wrong from the beginning. When we come back, Robert Durst's seventh day on the stand. How can we tell fact from fiction what the prosecutor is doing to call Durst out on what he thinks are lies? Next. Welcome back. We look to California where Robert Duras is still on the stand after seven days of questioning, three in cross-examination. The real estate heir is on trial for the murder of his best friend, Susan Berman. Duras has also been previously accused of murdering his first wife, Kathy, after her disappearance in 1982. Shortly before she vanished, Durst started a relationship with Prudence Farrow, sister to actor Mia Farrow, and the inspiration for the Beatles songs, Dear Prudence. One question about his affair, Durst says that it was resolved once Kathy went missing. Kathy knew that I was seeing Prudence. By seeing Prudence, meaning you were sleeping with her, correct? Correct. You wanted to pursue a relationship with Prudence by your own statement. Kathy did not want you to pursue a relationship with Prudence. And I'm asking you, how did that get resolved? He Durst has also testified to his tendency to lie to officials, not just in interrogations or even on the stand, but also to the filmmakers of the jinx. Prosecutor Lewin did not let this slide. On the third day, you knew that was a lie, correct? Because you knew you had said that to him the day before. Is that right? I lied to Andrew repeatedly. W which... So which version, were you lying on the 12th, or the 13th, or both? Oh. How are we supposed to figure out when you're lying and when you're telling the truth? I don't know. If you think of it, let me know. Interrupt me. The question is not, does Bob Durst remember what happened that night? 
the question is, is Bob Durst being truthful about what he's saying? Do you understand my question? I do. Okay. Can you answer it? I agree. Okay. It is rumored that Durst employed his best friend, Susan Berman, to call in sick to Kathy's rotation the day that she went missing, an accusation that Durst denies. But is this also a lie? If you had had Kathy and Susan call Dean Cooperman and ask her to pretend to be Kathy Durst, would you tell us? Susan Berman never called Albert Einstein or Dr. Cooperman pretending to be Kathy Durst. Objection, non-responsive, motion to strike. They're together and they're standing up. He doesn't like your question. I don't think he likes any of my questions, but... That's... Hi, John. <laughs> Your Honor, you've had front row seats to seeing Robert Durst testify. He lies here, he lies there. It seems like Robert Durst lies everywhere. So how can a jury find anything he says credible? I don't think they can. I think he's gotten away with it before. But this time, I think he's overplayed his hand. All right, it seems like maybe he's met the end or got to the end of his rope when it comes to his lies. And I think... Uh, I agree with Lewin. How do you believe him with anything? Terry, Durst admitted that the affair with Prudence Farrow was resolved when Kathy disappeared. Was that a Perry Mason moment? I think this was definitely a Perry Mason moment. Lewin went into great details about the affair, and it was a long-time affair. But in December 1981, Durst wanted to pursue that relationship, and Kathy did not want him to pursue that relationship. Then when Lewin said, so how did that get resolved? Durst walked right into the trap. He said, well, Kathy disappeared. What we didn't hear on that clip, but what Durst and Lewin did say after that was, Lewin said, yes, that is how it got resolved. And that was a very good point. All right, will Robert Durst talk himself into a conviction or out of one? We don't know, but continue to follow Long Crime. Thank you for joining us here on Long Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.